This is Join Us in France, episode 321. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and today I bring you a conversation with Elise about the Marais Poitevin, also known as La Venise Verte. This is a lovely piece of France between Niort and La Rochelle, not too far from the Atlantic coast. So we'll do an episode about La Rochelle specifically that will come out in a couple of weeks. The name Marais Poitevin means the marsh of the Poitou, but everyone calls it Marais Poitevin or Green Venice in English because there are boat rides. It's a place most French people have heard of and lots of us visit every year, but it's not as popular with foreign visitors. I don't know why that is because it's a wonderful place where you can enjoy nature, bike rides, bucolic walks, and lots of fun boat rides. It's gorgeous and restful. Both Elise and I have been there and you'll soon understand why we enjoyed it so much. If you like what we do here at Join Us in France, which is always talk about France, consider supporting us by going to patreon.com forward slash join us, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, join us, no spaces or dashes. And for Elise, it's patreon.com forward slash Elise Art, E-L-Y-S-A-R-T. And you can support also by visiting joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique to check out my cookbook, Join Us at the Table, or my Paris tours. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 321, the numeral, where you can see a recap of what we've discussed as well as links to relevant resources. And you should follow Addicted to France on Instagram to see my photos of the Marais Poitevin. I'll post them this week. And the best way to stay in touch with me and with the podcast is to sign up for the newsletter at joinusinfrance.com forward slash newsletter. How are you today? Today I am okay. Yeah. I am housebound because it's not very nice out. And um, we're having actually some real winter weather here, which is unusual. Yeah, we are. It's it's getting, it's, we're recording this on January 1st and yeah. it's, uh, it's wintry. It's cold and freezing. <laughs> it's cold. It's been cold for a while and we've had a lot of rain and we're supposed to Actually, Annie, we might have a few snowflakes in Toulouse. Yes, we might. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> she's, she's skeptical. Okay, let her be skeptical. There you are. It's been wet, which and it's wet, and that's a good lead-in to what we're going to talk about today. Exactly. We're going to talk about the wetlands of uh, the Marais Poitevin. Yes, Marais Poitevin. So this is in the Vendée. Which is, uh, well, when, when we went a few years back, we were staying in La Rochelle, which is a beautiful town that we haven't done an episode about. What are we, we waiting oh, for? Well, we, have to, we have to remedy that. Yes, <laughs> yes. Sure. What are we waiting for? Anyway. What are we waiting for? I don't know. Yes, yeah. but it's, it's in that part of France and it's absolutely gorgeous. And I have a list of several things that you should not miss when you go. But first, Elise is going to tell, you, tell us a little bit about the history, which I know zero about. We she knows zero about. Well, um, <laughs> I knew you'd tell me, so that's okay. The, 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 the Marais Poitevin. Marais is the word for marshland, basically, in French, okay? And, and Poitevin is the term, actually, for uh, the language, which I, I didn't know until I went back to do some, some historical research. But it's actually the term for the people and the language of the area called Le Poitou. Yeah. And uh, Le Poitou is... If you take a look at a map of France, it's the it's the most western central section 
of France that goes out to touch the Atlantic. And uh, the two cities that basically, one, the northern city, it's not a city that many people have heard of other than people who live in France. It's called New York. And the southern reaches of this area are is La Rochelle, which is, you know, of course, on, on the coast and absolutely beautiful. And it's in the part called the Chant. Yeah. Um, the the the, the uh, Poitou was historically a very very important province before the revolution when it had its own leaders and uh, the the capital of uh, Poitou was and uh, basically still is actually Poitiers. Um, yeah. And and Poitiers is a very lovely small city, which is known and associated with Eleanor of Aquitaine, sure. and one of my favorite women in history. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, but what makes this area interesting is that it's very different from the lands south of it, which is going into the area called the Charente, which is very uh, beautiful rolling hills and relatively dry. <laughs> Uh, and and the as you go north and uh, out of this area, you go basically up towards uh, Brittany. But this particular area, and this is one of the things that I found fascinating reading about it, if you take a look at the map of France and the coastline of France along the Atlantic, on, underneath south of Brittany, um, th- th- there was, in fact, a huge bay. Uh, and it was called the, the Gulf of the Picton. And the Picton was the name of the ancient uh, Gaul tribe, the Gauls that lived there. Uh, and interestingly enough, Picts, the Picts are also the ones who went across at some prehistory time and settled the north of uh, England. Uh, it's the same peoples. Um, and, and that Gulf uh, slowly receded uh, so that by uh, about 5,000 years ago, uh, there was no longer a sea there, but there were the marshlands. And uh, th- these marshlands basically uh, stayed that way uh, for, for quite a while. And it's uh, after the Camargue, which we have talked about, we talked about when we talked about um, uh, Louis IX and, and, uh, and yeah. leaving to go on the Crusades. Uh, but after the uh, Camargue, this is the only major wetland uh, or marshland area in in all of France, and it's over a hundred thousand hectares, which is very very big. And that's like two hundred and forty thousand acres. Yeah, uh, it's a big, so big area. It's a very very big area, and so uh, little by little, uh, over the last five thousand years. The waters receded and receded in apparently some very strange ways. And uh, my husband, who's got a real background in geography and geology, was very upset yesterday because I really was not able to retain any of the technical aspects of this. So um, I, I didn't think it was really that necessary. But it is, he was very upset. He was really very upset. It's like, my goodness gracious, what do you talk about in these podcasts? You know. Um, you know. So, uh, but what had, what happened that way is that it developed into um, th- these very narrow waterways that were natural waterways, but also there are sections of it, and probably this is very similar to what happened years and years and years ago up in, up in the Netherlands. Uh, there are areas that are grasslands, that are really beautiful grasslands, and then there are areas that are basically forest with water, mm. um, which is, of course, uh, what makes it such a beautiful area to visit because it's very special in that way. It's not tropical. It's really these beautiful forests with the water in them. And so what happened was that uh, when uh, we get to the time of the Romans, so this is already uh, for us in a sense, this is almost modern history in relation to what was happening in this area, the Romans actually started to create waterways that would take them from one of their settlements to another, but they didn't do excessive building in it, and maybe because it was just too marshy for them. Yeah, I, it, it's it's hard to know. I mean, it, it's certainly not an easy area to to uh, to work on. But what happened was that by the time you get to the beginning of let's say the early Middle Ages, uh, the six hundreds, uh, there are abbeys 
that are installed in various sections where the land is more or less dry because it really is a very complicated and complex kind of ecosystem there. And uh, the the uh, ruling the ruling class uh, is given more and more of land. Partly interestingly, because uh, by this time, of course, by the six and seven hundreds, we have uh, the Franks and then Charlemagne, who creates a unified uh, area. This is the northern part. Okay, this is not Occitania. So this is the northern part that's still basically under the very small kingdom of France. But what happens is because the land. They didn't think it was useful for any purposes other than sending some monks out to live in a monastery away from everything. Nobody cared about the land, you see. So so they just gave them these huge swaths of this land and gave them title to it. It's very interesting because I know you're going to mention a couple of uh, the the Addis, but but there there were four or five that became very, very important. And what happened was, and this is, of course, true of a lot of things in the Middle Ages, uh, a lot of the people who went to live in the monasteries, they realized that they could actually use the land for different things. And they started dividing sections off that would be used either for grazing, for for cows, for cattle, Hmm. or actually doing some agriculture, but figuring out what agriculture could be useful uh, and could be done in an area that was quite like that. Uh, And one of the first industries was salt, uh, which, of course, goes back way before even the Romans, because uh, even before then, people knew that uh, there was a way of getting salt out of the sea, and it was a, a trading, it was used for trade. I mean, salt was a very precious commodity in all through the Middle Ages because it was used to preserve foods. And the process, which is still used there, was by evaporation. So they would go and part of the lands that had the tides coming in. To this day, there are two terms that are used. They're called, in French, they're the wetlands and then the dry lands. And... Um, The difference is, those are the technical terms, but what the difference is really is that what they mean when they talk about the wetlands, and it's hard, if you go on to internet, you can see it's very convoluted which part is which. Uh, That means that they're affected still by the tides, Mm. and uh, the dry lands are not. The dry lands are humid. Yeah, I do remember that when we took the tour, the guide was telling us about that. You know, so so what happened was in the area where there are the wetlands, that's when the that's where the salt industry started to develop pre Roman and then was much more developed by the Romans and then even further developed and uh but the first canals now there are several different words. It's very strange because Poitevin is actually a dialect, uh and and I have absolutely no idea what, what the words are actually in it. But there's a word that they use for some of the canals. They call it a but, B-O-T. And that's not the same as the one used for computer language. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm assuming what it means is that it's one of these narrow canals that goes through a wooded area. But I'm not 100% sure because it's very hard to figure out the difference between the canals, the butts, and whatever else. But the very first charter for officially um, uh, an official canal uh, dug out through this area so that it could be used for transportation uh, was in the year 1200. Mm -hmm. And this was at the time when the abbeys were the most important and rich uh, rulers of the area. There was no secular rulers. And so the first canal was called the Canal of the Five Abbeys. Mm. In honor of the fact that they were the ones that ran it and controlled it and, of course, got their money from it. Um, And they had – they developed – there was grazing land. There was the development of – they actually raised fish. Now, this is interesting because now we think of this as a very modern end of 20th century kind of thing, you know, with all of the salmon up north and Norway and whatever. Uh, But there was actually uh, pisciculture going on at the time. Um, so the three main industries and sources of income were the grazing land for the cows, uh, fish, and salt. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was basically how these abbeys made money. Now, apparently, according you said that there were uh, some wine growing. I'm not sure where, probably obviously on the drier part, but um, 
I, I remember I've gone through it a few times myself, and I don't remember seeing it, but now you do see a lot of corn, uh, which grows on some of the drier lands there. Um, what happened was that this area became a source of great contention, and it, came, it became, a, during the time of the Eleanor of Aquitaine and right after, which is just around 1200, um, this was an area that was basically split between the region of the Dukes of Aquitaine and then the Kings of the North, uh, they were constantly, and then there were dukes of, of Poitou who, uh, and counts of the different regions. And of course, this is still a feudal time. So everybody was kind of fighting over who was going to get control over it, which is ironic because at first nobody cared about who had control over this area. And then all of a sudden, when it had some economic value, everybody wanted to have well, control of over it. Yeah, yeah. that's how which it is works. Typical, right? Yeah. And it's actually thanks to Henry IV, um, our famous king who converted to Catholicism uh, to have his throne, as they say, uh, who uh, created royal digs. And uh, obviously, that means that the money is going into the, the treasury, the, the royal treasury. But he created a post, I love it, it's the Grand Master of the Royal Dig. Uh, and the, the Grand Master of the Royal Dig is the person who surveyed uh, all of the transportation on all of these very, very beautiful little in-and-out waterways. Um, and, and, of course, this was not – it was more for transportation than it was for uh, irrigation. They didn't have to do any irrigation. What happened was that the style of <clears throat> the houses and these very tiny little villages that developed in the areas where they could – really is the same to, to this day, but because there was so little dry land, and this, of course, you know, too, because you've been there like I have, uh, the houses all face along the waterway. Mm -hmm. It's like every every village is basically a one-street long village. Yeah. Um, and the, the, every house has an entrance from the water and an entrance onto the pathway that's on the other side that yeah. is the only, until, in fact, one of the things I found out was until the recent times, that is really the end of the 19th century, the only access to some of these villages was to, with a boat. Right. There right. was just no, there, there were no roads because they did, they hadn't yet done any work to sort of dry something out. It's um, gotten better. <laughs> it's gotten better. It's, it's gotten a little bit better, yeah. yeah. Um, what, uh, the um, they, they created a governor of this region, uh, and and the second longest canal that was ever built there is a canal that still exists called the Canal du Vix, V-I-X, and it begins in the little town of Marantz, which um, – when, we, when you want to talk about the what, what there is to do and see there, I'll, I'll just make a comment again, but it's a very cute little town, and it goes mm -hmm. right from there uh, out. And it was Napoleon in the 19th century who created a waterway police mm. uh, because he wanted to make sure that the canal stayed open to everybody. Apparently, what happened was that there was fighting over who had priority over sections. And so in order to make sure that all of these canals stayed open and were available to everybody, he created the police. I don't know if it still exists. It's kind of fun to think that there's a waterway police there. You know? um, the well, there are definitely waterway police in France. I've seen them on the Canal du Midi. Are they? A, oh, so it must be the same. I wonder if he created it everywhere at the same time. Then. These are gendarmes. It's the gendarmes, and they. It's a, it's, it's a section of the gendarmes. Yeah, what it is. yeah, yeah. Today, uh, on the Canal du Midi, it's gendarmes, and they have special uniforms and they control uh, licenses of boats. I've seen them stop boats um, at Castelnaudary, and they just hop on and verify your paperwork and wish you a good trip. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it, it, interesting here, too, because, of course, this is an area that's actually fairly remote from other parts. I mean, it's very strange as a kind of uh, when you get there, you kind of feel like you've gone to another country. You know, it's just it, it really it's does very have different. A different. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's very, very different. different. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very different. You know, and, and so what happened was that uh, all of these canals, which were built up basically from the 17th to the beginning of the 19th century, uh, they were really, like the Canal du Midi, what happened was 
they were used for transportation until the trains came along. But also the, then, the, the idea was to drain the water. To drain the water yeah. and also to control. And it was, it was in the 20th century, really starting, I guess, in the 19th century, but really significantly more in the 20th century, that people, scientists and naturalists, started to realize that this was very precious area for the, the, the wildlife that was in it. Yeah. For the, the bird life, uh, the, the different kinds of species of fish, uh, different kinds of plants that grow there. When we were driving through at one point, we actually saw there's a section of it where they produce watercress, which I have to love. Um, and yeah. it was kind of fun because watercress is really grown next to the water, which yeah. they didn't, hadn't realized before, I guess. Um, and and uh, it, so it became very, very interesting to, to see. But, of course, what happened was at the beginning of the 20th century, it kind of became a backwater area. And uh, it was not a very w wealthy part of France uh, at all. And it was used for a lot of people to hide out in for a period of time, which is very interesting because once you get into the actual waterway f in the forest, it is really easy to get lost, you know. So yeah. you can imagine that it could be a good place to, for people to hide out. Uh, but, but what happened was eventually it was the movement – to preserve it as an environmentally specific area and to preserve the wildlife that became the most important part of it. And that is when the regional national, it's a regional park that is also a national park. I'm not quite sure what the difference is, but it's considered to be both. And it was in 1979 that it was created and it was designed to preserve all of the land as it is and to save the wildlife and to save all of the, the different flora and fauna that was there. But this is what's so strange. It, the park was created officially in 1979 and in 1994 it lost its title of a national park because they discovered that people were exploiting the area and in a way that was not uh, part of the charter for the park, and they were not preserving it the way it was supposed to be preserved. So between 1994 and 2014, that's 20 years, uh, the, there was a big push by the government, and it turns out that it was François Mitterrand, when he was president, who invested a huge amount of money to restore the canals, uh, the ports that were in each of these tiny little villages, uh, the fountains, create walkways and passerelles so that you could walk across some of these canals and bring back the quality of the natural land and everything about it so that finally in 2014, which is well after he was president, uh, it was given back its label. So... It's only been in the last six years that it received the label again of uh, a major wetland and a national preserve uh, for all of these reasons. And it's kind of fun because uh, I just made a list of a few of the animals uh, that you see there. Uh, there are otters, which I don't remember ever seeing, um, but they're protected there. And then there are the famous uh, the uh, nutria. Um, Right. Which are the, the ragodown? The ragodown, uh, yeah, nutria or koipu. Yeah, I, 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 it's. I don't know that other word. I mean, I looked it up to make sure I knew what what it was. But the the word I know of is nutria, so I don't know if it's the same exact thing. And or the not, word I know, know is ragodown, and and they're pestilence. <laughs> and they're pest because they were brought in. They aren't natural to the area, and they are, of course, uh, a pest. And they're they're really uh, well, considered to be a nuisance in the area because they reproduce and there's no natural enemy. Right. So uh, they're very cute. They're they're large rodent. They're yeah. uh, herbivorous. Yeah. They are semi-aquatic and they feed on the plant systems of the river of, of all the trees and stuff that grows along rivers or right. canals or whatever and so they're so they're not they don't like them very much well the thing is they kill trees because they, you know if they grow out of control it can kill the the trees and yeah uh, like, along, I, like I, Eber, you know. along the canal du midi i know that they trap them and kill them yeah so, I yeah. know they do. Yeah, yeah. I know it's kind of a shame. Yeah, yeah. But
but so they have otters, which I would love to have seen, but apparently yeah, I didn't see any of those. Uh, they've never seen them. They have, of course, uh, lots of herons, beautiful, beautiful gray birds, uh, birds, herons. yes, beautiful birds, and they have. Now this is fascinating. It's a reserve uh, for dragonflies. Hmm. So there's this huge number and collection of different kinds of dragonflies. Oh, that's I just I love dragonflies. Yeah, that would be nice. Well, with all that water, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, which means that they most likely have zillions of mosquitoes at certain times of the year. You know, um, but I don't remember the two times that I took a boat through there. I don't remember, and it was summertime. I don't remember being bothered by mosquitoes, but. Um, I but, see. I don't remember it either. So they probably. But the reality is, if they have a lot of birds, birds eat an awful lot of mosquitoes. That's true. So that you know, that's very true. if if it's a if it's a good ecosystem, probably they do have mosquitoes, but they have birds <laughs> that yeah. will eat the mosquitoes. So it's okay. Yeah. 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 And then they have and this is adorable. This reminds me of talking about the Solaris cow because I'm you know they, they, there's a special donkey that comes from this area called the Baudet du Poitou. Oh. And if you take a pic, uh, pictures of him on 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 um, internet, he's gorgeous. <laughs> like long, <laughs> long frizzy hair, and kind of a reddish brown color. And yeah, Bode is another large. word. It's Bode is another word for um, donkey in French. Oh, it's another word for donkey. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and he's just adorable, absolutely adorable. You know? um, and, and he's uh, native to that area. I guess he was brought in. God knows, probably centuries and centuries and centuries ago, but but he is specific uh, to that area. Oh, he looks and, really and furry. Isn't he cute? Yeah, he's cute. Isn't he adorable? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like I it. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> very, and, very and furry. <laughs> endless birds, of course. And then the boat there that they call, a, they can eat in the, in the local language, is called a bate. Um, uh, it's specifically designed to navigate the, the, the canals, which can be very narrow at, in places. So it's uh, it's designed so it's kind of like my feet. It's very wide in the front and very narrow in the back. You know? um, the back end, so the way you you use the boat, it's kind of like the gondolas in it. Is that it's, you have to sit or stand at the back of the boat, which is very narrow, comes to a very narrow point at the back. And you use one stick, like a, a sege, uh, to propel it. And it's wider in the front. And apparently it makes it much easier to to, to turn on these because there, there's places where you, there's really kind of interesting turns uh, in in and out, and uh, that's the traditional boat. It's a kind of flat bottom boat. Yeah. And they said that uh, in the past, and I guess some of the families that still have houses where they live really all year long and no longer just you know uh, not just vacation homes, that every family had several different sizes of boats because. Each boat was used for a different purpose. Right, depending and on where you wanted to go with them. Depending on where you wanted to go and whether you were shipping, if it was to ship goods or if it was take the people or whatever it was, yeah. so that they had different sizes of boats. So uh, it's really a fascinating area. It's it's an area that is more famous for its nature, uh, for the, yeah. the the things you see there in terms of nature. In the midst of this, and when you get a little further away from the actual sea, uh, you get uh, different abbeys. Uh, you have a cathedral in this town of Luzon, which is a town I've gone through zillions of times. When we go up to Brittany, we, we pass through there. Luzon. Uh, how, do you, how do you spell it? Oh, L-U-C, Cedilla, O-N. O-N. Okay, yeah. okay. I see and it, And it yeah. has this huge, huge cathedral in it. It's very strange because this is a part of France that up until the revolution – had more importance. So there were more people then than there are now in the area, although now that things are being delocalized, you know, and people are, are trying to work more from home and things like that, there are probably small co- businesses and companies that will set up in different places. But when you leave, when you go to the outer edges, as you go up towards the north, uh, you get to more of the agricultural land, and then you see the land where these different abbeys were. And uh, Luzon's cathedral is very impressive, partly because the town is very small, you know, and it was obviously much, much bigger at, at one point. Mm. So it's really a kind of a, a neat area to go to. Um, yeah. And, uh, 
I just before you you take over with the activities thing, I just want to say this is the mission of the park, okay? Uh, so, and this is obviously because obviously they had, it's unusual for uh, an area to be given a label of uh, an important park and then have the label taken away. So when it was given back six years ago, um, they created a commission uh, to make sure that, that it's supervised. So they say it's to preserve re and restore the natural resources with a balance between use of the land and leaving it in a wild state. Uh, they want to create a sustainable economy for the people who do live in the area. Yeah. Uh, they ask for the local people to participate in all decisions and and, and to have what they call reasonable tourism. Yeah. Yeah, there there were plenty of tourists when I went, and of course the the whole area, La Rochelle, is hugely popular. Il Dorée, Il Dorée is another big uh, kind of draw in the area. Right. Il Dorée, Il Doléron is also another big place that draws a lot of people. Um, it, there's plenty to see in this area, and we we really haven't done very many podcasts about that part of France. But this might no, be the first one. Our next one should be La Rochelle. La Rochelle and Ile de Ré. I mean, you know, I don't Absolutely. know if you've been, but I've been. It's, it's lovely. Um, anywho, um, so the, the, the five things that you must do when you go to the Marais Poitevin, first thing is you must take a boat ride. And, yep. and there are six towns from which uh, they offer boat rides. There are different types of boat rides um, owned by different people, but essentially it's the same thing. You have a, a young person, usually a young man, who will um, act like a, like a gondola person. Right, he, exactly. He pushes the, a, a stick to the bottom of the canals, and right. that propels the 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 boat uh, forward and it's they do set things uh, you know so it's i don't know that it makes very much difference which one you go to if you're staying uh okay it depends on where you stay because if you stay in in one beautiful little town uh, that you could stay in when you do this visit is fontenay le comte mm -hmm. and so so that's the north side and then you'd go probably to the boats n near there uh you could also st stay in Niort, that's n-i-o-r-t and it's uh, also a, a lovely town and that's to the west of the marais poitevin what? Yeah. No, right. no, no, no. It's, it's, no, it's to the, to the east. east. Sorry, east. To the east. To the east. To the yes. East. Yeah. <laughs> the west, you go into the Atlantic, Annie. Right, right. To the, to the west, it's actually La Rochelle, is where we were staying right. when we did this. But that's probably a little further away than would be ideal. If I was to do this again, I would... I would probably stay in Niort or, or in uh, Fontenay-le-Comte or something like this. But now I can mention two others. Just the, there's the Marantz, which is the one where I've, we've had lunch probably now about ten times and walked around. And it was from there that we took a boat. Uh, the, the, from there, there were two different kinds of boats. There was the bigger kind where you have. Uh, you can drive it yourself, but you can't go into the narrowest of the little canal. Right. But there also, and it wasn't there, it was in another town, but I don't remember what which one, where we actually we were just four people. We didn't even have a, I don't know if you call it a driver. We got one of those boats and took it ourselves. Right, you can do uh, that, yes. You can do that. Yes. And there's another town that's very pretty called Saint-Saëns, S-A-N-S-A-I-S. -S -S. Let me look, I, I'm trying to find it. Saint-Saëns, Saint-Saëns. And it's got some of those very lovely houses that are typical of the area, which are they're low, and they border along the canals, and it's just very quiet and lovely there. It's it's just a beautiful little area. You'll have plenty of choices of places to stay. So I would definitely do a boat ride. I would definitely go bird watching. Uh, yes. There's a uh, Réserve Naturelle Nationale, Michel Brosselin. And uh, you pay a fee, and you go in this kind of observation thing where they provide binoculars, and there's a person explaining what you're looking at. 
there's probably many other ways to go do bird watching, but that's one where you can, you know, you can pay a fee and they hold your hand. And it's not very expensive. It's like five euros or something. And uh, they will tell you what you're looking at, which is always a, a, a good thing. Right. Then there's a couple of abbeys that are beautiful in the area. There's the Abbe, Abbe de Maillezé and another one called Abbe de Niol. Uh, and they both look very nice. Uh, L'abbé de Maillezé look kind of, it's out in the boonies. Uh, it looks very yeah. rural. Uh, L'abbé de Niel looks, uh, uh, well, I'm not sure if it's in the town or not, actually, to tell you the truth, because I don't remember, I don't think we went. But it has something to do with Eleanor of Aquitaine, which, of course, a lot of places in this area would have something to do with of Eleanor course. of Aquitaine. Right being put to right yeah it's it, it, it's really got a, it's very interesting uh it's very bucolic it's very peaceful yeah um it, it's uh there's something really charming about it you know yeah. it, it, it has a certain quality and it feels like a little out of time to me yeah know? yeah it, it, it's almost like it's got stuck in some little time <laughs> thing so it doesn't catch up with the 21st century quite yet not you know, quite not quite thing. yeah and and for those of you who like to go to vineyards there's uh les vignobles de Mareuil Mareuil sur les ça s'appelle um, it must be closer to La Rochelle, I would think. Probably right? probably let's see if I can find it on the map as you get closer to Lower Shell, you definitely are in the Chalant and you're definitely in, yes, in, in, yes. in grape country. Right. Know? So there's there's also some wineries that you can visit in that area. The gastronomy of the area is interesting. So um, I, I just did a search and I came up with uh, Les Mojettes. So that's those are beans. They're white beans. And to tell you uh -huh. the truth, they're the ones that I use when I make cassoulet. <laughs> Ah. because they're cheap and they're good and they kind of hold their shape really well and they're big enough, ah. they're large enough. Uh, so there's that. There's a butter called the Le Beurre Déchiré. Hmm. Échiré being the name of the place. I have never tried it, but I get the impression that it's not a salted butter, so I wouldn't like it anyway. Oh, I would. So there you are. <laughs> there we are. They they uh, make pâté de ragondin. Oh no. So so the the nutria or the uh, koipu they make pâté out of it. Yes, I would not eat that. That no. would, that would not go into my body, but it's a local specialty. Why why not? Uh, they have a nice cheese called le chabichou. Chabichou, it's a goat cheese, and um, it's kind of. Yeah, you know, if you it would fit the palm of into the palm of your hand. It's not a very like a big. Yeah. Well, no, it's bigger. It's oh, kind it's of bigger. A, it's like a not a pyramid shape, but um, kind of a rectangular shape thingy that kind uh -huh. of tapered at the top, and the surface of it looks like brains, like oh. it has a lot of folds. Oh. Lots and lots of folds. Yeah. Um, mm. I tried to see if I could order one uh, at my local uh, Carrefour Market for, for, from their, you know, the the, the pickup the service that I do. And they right. don't have it on the thing. So I'm going to have to wait until I go to a proper fromagerie to, to get that, I think. See, see, see if they've even heard of it, because it could be one of the few cheeses that doesn't go out of its neighborhood. It could be. It could be. Yeah, it's a shabby shoe anyway. Um, and then they have a sort of dessert. It's a sort of Napoleon, a, a millefeuille. Hmm. It's called scofa. And oh. uh, it was made by nuns originally, and now it's it's a it's a type of dessert that sounds interesting. Anyway, so it's just a beautiful area that I think I enjoyed my our visit there. We didn't stay very long. I think it might be worth if I if I did this again, I would I would take two days. I would do. Uh, explore the canals on one day and then do bird watching on the second day. And definitely, day. yeah, definitely I would read up on the local birds and uh, try and find somebody who could take me to see the local birds um, besides going to that 
to that place where you, you know they they have a, a whole setup right because well, for it, photography it, it, you know it's it'd be cool to for, for you that's right i mean yeah. i just remember it just it we did an afternoon on the canals and then i stopped many times but more or less just to go and visit the little town and then walk around a little bit but uh it was just so magically peaceful yeah. you know uh it because it's not it's very different i know i've been to the everglades and i've been to places in the camargue and everything this is very different somehow yes I mean, it's very different from the everglades it's the, you have the, the 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 canals that just go right in between all the trees and then all of a sudden you come to a few houses and you wonder what they're doing there because it doesn't <laughs> look like they're on solid land and uh i was just looking at my notes again and there are Still to this day, four villages that have only access by water. Huh. And I, when you know, a village in this case is really a small village. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, you know, it's daddy, really just yeah. a, uh, like a few houses or something like that. But uh, it, it's kind of, I just have this memory of a place that was filled with birds and very peaceful and very green. And Oh, it's just a little bit like oh, it's like walking into a fairy tale land, you know. Yeah. And it's called it's called the Green Venice, by the way. Yes, yes, la petite Venise ou la Venise verte, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's a... This is about as far from the the environment of Toulouse as you can get, Annie. Yes, it's very different, and it's 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 just very pleasant, like you mentioned. I remember one funny thing that happened during our visit, and I even have a picture of it, so I'll I'll put it. Uh, I'll... I'll publish it on um, Instagram. It's not that great of a picture, but it shows what happens very well. In these kinds of canals, because they are surrounded by trees, the yeah. leaves fall in the water and then they right. sink down to the bottom and that gets putrefied. And so if the the person who's running the boat, if they kind of stir up the bottom, bubbles come up. And oh. and that's natural gas. And he lit oh. one. You can see the flame on the on the water. Really? Yes, oh. yes. So it it was kind of fun. But I mean, he had to really go out of his way to stir up the the the, the bottom of the of the canal. The sludge, to, the yeah, sludge, the yeah, yeah, the sludge to get it to happen. But it was it was very fun. So I really recommend it. I think. I, we were with our daughter. She was probably twelve or thirteen when we did this, and she loved it. She was like, "Yeah, this this is all good." And and you can do a lot of nature walks. They have a very yes. well developed. Um, they have a, their tourism sites are very well developed, and I will put a link to brochures that they have that show all sorts of things you can do by bike, you know, hikes, uh, beach stuff, canal stuff, um, just, just very, a very fun part of France. That it, we... It's very fun. And you're absolutely right, because we went with these, my good friends when they were visiting from States, and he was really into bird watching so it was like going to heaven for him yeah you know? if you like um, bird watching and if you have little kids i think this one is a must do it's a it's a must do and it really is true yes one of the things that happened when they reopened the park was that they had made it so that there were walkways and there were little bridges over some of the canals so there's a whole system they, they I, I wasn't sure where they're located, but there are a couple of tourist centers that you can start from that give you maps of the whole area, you know, so yeah. you, you can do by boat, you can go by, by foot, and uh, it, it's just very, very nice. Well, and the, and the link that I'm going to put on the website will have uh, places where you can uh, download all these uh, tourist maps onto your right. own computer and print them at home, so you, you know, you can look at stuff now and not everything is in in english um obviously that and f i mean this is just how it is in france uh, we have a lot more resource for such things in french than we do in english but a map is a map is a map i mean you can you know yeah it, it, it'll show you where the interesting stuff is and and then you can take it from there and then you can just feel very French when you go visit there. Exactly. Yeah, I don't remember a lot of foreigners when we... I, I remember a lot of French retirees and young families. Yeah, I think there are a fair number of English because they're, they're, they have closer... Or there were. I don't think there will be anymore, but, you know... Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
yeah, we'll see what happens with that. But there were, you know, because it's an area that's accessible, especially with people who are coming and staying in La Rochelle and things like that, you know. So, uh, but but yeah, it's it's a nice special part of uh, France and has a long, long, long history too. The Marais Poitevin. Yep. Thank you so much, Elise. That was really interesting, and it brought me back to my visit there, which. Uh, I will post photos of of the Marie Poitevin. And back then, I didn't have my fancy camera. So I, I'm surprised that my photos turned out as well as they did because it was a cheap camera. Because you're a good photographer, Annie. <laughs> well, okay, but the camera helps. <laughs> Merci, Elise. You are quite welcome, Annie. Au revoir. Bye. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com forward slash join us. Thank you to all of you for supporting the show. Some of you for a long time. You are wonderful. And a shout out this week to new patrons. Deborah Richer, Lenny Wong, Dave Kerwin, and Erica Yops. Thank you so much for becoming patrons and making this podcast possible. This week, I sent my patrons my recipe for galette des rois, both brioche and frangipane, and I hope several of them test it and send me their feedback, just like the recipe testers did. Elise, how is your Patreon going? Oh, my Patreon is going very nice and slow and steady, just like me, you know, like a snail, <laughs> you know. Really, you know, um, I have two new patrons, and I would like to uh, give a nice shout out to them. That is Deborah and Emily. Thank you so very, very much for becoming patrons and joining my little group on Elise's Corner. Every new person is so deeply appreciated. You cannot imagine, and it warms my heart. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, just keep coming and uh, I'm happy that you're listening and I'm happy that you like my participation and so thank you again one and all for being patrons on Elise's Corner and to find it you go to patreon.com forward slash Elise Art so that's patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n Elise Art is e-l-y-s-a-r-t yes it is and thank you everyone and thank you, everyone. For the French tip of the week this week, here's a cute French expression for you. Appeler un chat un chat. Cela veut dire appeler les choses en leur nom, être franc et direct dans son langage, parler franchement des sujets délicats. Donc, appeler un chat un chat. In English, you would say to call a spade a spade. But in French, we say to call a cat a cat. And I think cats are cuter than spades. <laughs> French wins. Just remember, appelez un chat un chat. And woohoo, there is now a shelter dog named Major in the White House. Don't you get carried away with pride, Major? You've got Nemo to contend with. Nemo lives at the Élysée Palace with Emmanuel Macron and his wife Brigitte. Nemo was adopted from a dog shelter in a small town called Hermeray, near Paris. I've never been to it. I'm not sure that's how they say it, but I think it's Hermeray. And being a young dog, just like Major, Nemo introduces some surprises sometimes. Like he peed on the fireplace during a meeting Macron was having. And it's all on video, of course. Uh, Macron said it was the first time he did that. I don't know. I've met young dogs. They have a mind of their own sometimes. I'll post a link to that video on the Join Us in France closed group on Facebook today. The reactions of everyone around the room was priceless. <laughs> and about the Bernie memes going around, it occurs to me that he must have been less worried about fashion than I am, which says a lot. Mind you, if I were going to the White House, I would probably look for my good leather gloves. 
But my sister won't let me forget that one day, soon after I moved home to France, both of our kids were going to the village elementary school, so this was years ago. One morning, she dropped off her son at school, and she lived a little further away than me, so she drove him to school. And she saw me walking to school with my adorable daughter in one hand and my newly groomed standard poodle in the other hand with that amazing strut that standard poodles have and me wearing pajama pants underneath my coat. (laughs) She said we were quite the sight. She later called me to remind me that pajama pants are not okay in public in France. And of course, she was right. (laughs) No more pajama pants in public for me. Pinky swear. And some of you will find this funny and others won't. It tickled my funny bone. The Grévin Museum in Paris has already taken away the statue of Donald Trump from the museum floor. That statue was a problem because people kept taking inappropriate selfies with it. Notably, they were sticking their fingers in his nose for some reason. And at Grévin, it's okay. to It's made for selfies. So you're supposed to be able to approach the wax person and put your arm around them or shake their hands or whatever but putting your fingers up their nose is not okay (laughs) so that particular statue had to be watched constantly so now that he's no longer the president the problem is solved he's in the basement (laughs) quick update on my fiber optics situation we called it free yeah, because uh, one of the providers, one of the massive providers of, of cell phone service and optic, fiber optics and such is Free. The other is Orange. Um, Bouygues is a third one. And there are others. Anyway, we called Free on Monday as soon as my cable was uh, pre- ready, you know. And they gave us an appointment to switch to fiber optics in a month. <laughs> Things are never fast in France, like I've mentioned a couple of times on this podcast, but I have confidence that this time they'll be able to snake the thing through and I'll be very happy with my new fast internet. And a quick update on my hedgehog. He does not come out every night these days, which is normal because he hibernates for a few days, like maybe seven, ten days, and then he wakes up for a few hours uh, just just to go take a long drink. Uh, And then he goes back to his hiding, sleeping place. Uh, He doesn't eat much this time of year. They're supposed to gain a lot of weight before, you know, the winter, before it gets too cold. And then they just come out to drink a little bit. But I just like having a hedgehog next to me. When I wake up in the night and I think, oh, there's a hedgehog right outside my house. How nice. (laughs) Anyway, uh, so we had a warm day this week um, and I wanted to spend time outside because, you know, these days it's been pretty cold. So I decided to use my leftover lumber to try to build a new habitat for the hedgehog. So I won't know if it gets picked uh, as as a good habitat or not until next spring, probably when the mamas go looking for a new place to have their babies, but it'll be ready by then. So I'm excited about that. This week, I'll be making a signature dish from the island of La Réunion. It's called rougaille saucisse. It's very simple to make. It's really tasty. I've made it a few times throughout my life and uh, once last week and I'll make it again. I'll probably include it in the next cookbook because it's delicious and I bet you've never heard of it. That's not something they serve at restaurants unless you go to specifically uh, restaurants from La Réunion. There is definitely more to French food than the classics from mainland France and I'll send the first drop of that recipe to my patrons um, soon so they can give it a try. Join Us in France was features uh, in the Alliance Française magazine. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. That was really nice. And if you found the podcast and are new to listening to it uh, because of it, I thank you for being here. Francophiles tend to have a good time here and I am delighted to have you. A company called Rephonic has launched a podcast audience graph. It uses data from Apple Podcasts to display a 3D graph of the other shows that uh, my listeners enjoy. So it was fun to see. Lots of you also enjoy podcasts about Italy, which I hadn't 
you know, I didn't know that. Uh, there will be a link to that graph in the show notes so you can take a look at it. This week, I finished a really nice book about the French Revolution that, okay, I, I really liked it because it's short. It's only 184 pages, and yet it's comprehensive enough to get the big picture of a really complicated story. It's called The French Revolution, and it's by Emma Moreau, M-O-R-E-A-U. Right now, it's only $1.99 on Kindle, and I'll put it on my list of faves, which you can see by going to joinusinfrance.com for slash boutique. I think it's well worth the read. Some of the people who reviewed it uh, negatively said it was too short and lacked detail, but let me tell you, I have read books about the French Revolution that lacked no detail, like, ugh detail after detail after detail after detail and they gave me a headache so if you just want the gist of the french revolution you'll enjoy this book by emma morrow in June 2020, I released an episode about full immersion programs in France, and I suggested I could put together a week of full immersion near, uh, near me, near Toulouse. And lots of you responded. I'm still committed to making it happen, but it will not be until probably uh, the late spring or early summer of 2022. The French health minister hopes to have enough vaccines for all French people by late August 2021. So that's if all goes well with pharmaceutical companies and their vaccine delivery schedule. That to me means that normal travel for pleasure will not resume until at the earliest, the fall of 2021. I hope that I'm not overly pessimistic, but that's my guess. The numbers of uh, new COVID-19 infections in France have stayed at a uh, pretty stable between 20,000 and 30,000 every day. We're on a very high plateau. Health authorities are worried about the new variants taking over because that bug spreads even easier than the original one. It's entirely likely that um, when the English variant takes hold in France, I say when and not if, and they calculate that it might be the case by March, the numbers will get even bigger. We can see that England is dealing with more than 50,000 new infections every day right now, so almost twice as many as France uh, at on, on similar days. So that would probably mean another more severe lockdown. Right now, we have a curfew from 6 p.m. until 6 a.m., and that helps, but it's not enough to stop this virus, and it's a bit of a pain. I mean, I imagine families with kids, if both parents work, then they have to pick up the kids from school and do their grocery shopping and errands and whatever, all before 6 p.m. It's difficult. It's really difficult, and it's also difficult for students. It's this whole situation is um, terrible. Now, I know that most of my listeners live in wealthy countries where vaccine distributions has started. In France, it has started, it started really slow. It's picked up speed, but we're going to have to be patient. But within a few months, like I said, you know, probably the, by the end of August, everyone in France will have had a chance to be vaccinated. But we need to remember something. This vaccine needs to be shared uh, worldwide. Why? Because if we leave poorer countries unvaccinated, it will allow the virus to circulate freely there. This virus will continue to mutate, because they all do, and eventually that mutation might get to the point where the vaccine we're all rushing to get as soon as possible today will not be effective against it. And then we're, we'd be back to square one. So pandemics are a public health problem, not one country's problem. We have to bring everybody into this, these vaccination efforts. If you enjoy the show, introduce a friend to the podcast and show them how to listen. Next week on the podcast, an episode about what it's like to grow old in France. Lots of you are considering moving to France at some point. So what happens when you get old? You need to know about these things so you can be prepared. Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. 
The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2021 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.